Miracles, miracles, miracles. Everyone wants a miracle. In fact, everyone would love to see a miracle. The subject of miracles has taken center stage in today's Christianity. In fact, for many Christians today, a church that does not perform miracles is a sign that Jesus is absent in that church and naturally no one wants to go there. Everybody is looking for a church, for a fellowship, for a congregation where miracles are being performed. Not so long ago, I was contacted by my former schoolmate who, on hearing that I am a pastor, asked if she would come and be a member of my church. And the moment I answered that yes, she could actually come, the next question she asked was, do you perform miracles and healings at your church? As you can imagine, she's not alone in this. She speaks for so many people across the world today who think that the mark of an effective church or a spirit-filled church is an encounter with the supernatural. So the test for a faithful pastor or an anointed pastor today is whether these pastors perform miracles or not. Underneath this quest, this desperate search and hunger for the supernatural lies so many questions that remain unanswered and which I hope that you and I can think through some of them today. For instance, what is a miracle? When we say we need a miracle, what are we actually talking about? How do we know whether a certain experience is a miracle or not? And supposing we, and indeed as we agree that miracles are God-ordained, how do we know whether a miracle is from God or not? And is it really true that everyone who performs miracles is a man of God? Is it possible that somebody could have power or somebody could be able to do something supernatural and yet not be a man of God? Serious questions, honest questions that deserve honest answers. For me to help you understand a little bit about what miracles are, I would like to ask you to come with me to the book of Acts. And we look at chapter 3 and especially look at one of the miracles performed in the Bible and see if we can learn something about what a miracle is, what the Bible says about miracles, who should receive them, what the purpose of these miracles really are. Acts chapter 3 is a story about a man who was lame for a very long time, who daily would sit at the gate called beautiful in the hope that he would receive help from those who were coming into the temple to pray. Listen to what the word of God says, Acts chapter 3 from verses 1. Now, Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask for alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for arms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them and in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate 
when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy One, the Righteous One, and asked for a murder to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. By his name and by faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up a prophet like me from your brothers, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Indeed, a very, very long passage to read, but very powerful and insightful. And I hope from it we can learn more about miracles and what it means for us as believers and how we are able to relate not just with the miracles showcased in this passage, but even beyond the miracles themselves to the God who works these miracles. Now, a number of questions can be asked to help us understand this passage. For instance, what prompted the miracle? When we look through this passage, what would we say is the basis or the source of this miracle? What was the purpose of this miracle that was performed? What are the characteristics of this miracle? And how do we compare biblical miracles as demonstrated in this passage with today's miracles that we see in our churches, in our fellowships, in our Christian gatherings? Where is the relationship and where are the differences and what do we conclude from those differences? So if we go back to our first question and ask ourselves, what prompted this miracle? As you look through this passage, the first thing that you actually see is that this miracle was not planned. Remember, this is Peter and John going to the temple at their usual time to pray. They are not going for a ministry. They are not expecting to meet anybody. They have not even prayed that God will use them today to do a miracle. Or if they did, at least the book of Acts does not capture that. But this is an ordinary situation, ordinary men of God going to a temple for the ordinary time of prayer. And boom, they encounter a man. This man is not even a new man. He's been on the temple gate for almost 40 years. And what is he doing at the temple gate? Waiting for people to give him arms, assistance, something to eat or drink maybe. This man himself is not expecting anything supernatural. So from the outset we can tell that this is a miracle that is not planned. This is a miracle that the man does not even ask for by the way. This man, as usual, puts out his hand. He's hoping he can receive some help, but he's not thinking heaven is going to open and release the supernatural. So one characteristic of miracles, when we talk about miracles from the biblical point of view, is that they are not planned by the preacher or by the pastor. This is not a case where you have a miracle service and you have invited people to bring the lame, the sick, the blind, the, the dead, uh, and you are hoping that at a certain time during the service, then miracles are going to break forth and touch each and every one of them. When you find a church that is planning miracles, you already know there is a problem. 
Today you see adverts all over the city. Come, the man of God is in town. At around five, he's going to be healing the sick. He even sets the time when God will start performing miracles. And it makes you wonder, if God is performing miracles according to the pastor's timetable, who's really in charge here? Is this God or is this the pastor in charge? From the outset in this passage, we can tell that when we think about a miracle, we are thinking about a supernatural encounter divinely and sovereignly orchestrated by God to his glory. While man may be a participant and a witness, he is not the source, he is not the orchestrator, nor is he the sustainer. So when we think about a miracle, we think about something divine. We think about a supernatural encounter. We think about the sovereign hand of God at work. We think about man as the recipient, not really the originator. And man as the one that must continue to wonder and be amazed at what God is doing supernaturally. We also notice that this miracle uh, happens in a manner that this miracle is instant, is complete, is visible and verifiable and is undeniable. Why is this important? As we look through our church services and our ministries today, you will notice that there is a different trend that miracles in our churches today take. Usually when the man of God has prayed for you, in most cases the instant is not, the, the, rather the healing is not instant. Maybe he will tell you to go and continue praying and believe in God and along the way you may receive your healing. In most cases, the miracles that are believed to have happened are not visible, therefore cannot be verified. In a sense, they are really subjective. Maybe somebody has been healed of a headache or a back pain or maybe some nausea and it's good to experience healing. But you see, this is only experienced by the person who says so. How does the rest of the congregation know that actually healing has taken place? In the case of Acts chapter 3, this man does not need to convince anyone. He was at one moment lame and everybody could see that. All of a sudden, he's straight, his ankles and legs are strong, he can walk, he can jump. And it is undeniably clear, even for the opponents of the apostles, that the supernatural hand or power is at work in this case. His miracle is instant. He does not need to go home and pray about it for a week before he can actually begin to walk. His miracle does not even need prayer. Do you notice that Peter and John did not pray, by the way? Now, today's pastors will not only organize a miracle service, but they will create a conducive atmosphere for the miracle to happen. Maybe they will begin with music and worship that drives you emotionally, and then they will ask you to raise your hands, maybe even kneel down, maybe ask other believers to hold hands in a circle and try to energize the miracle. But when you come to Acts chapter 3, what do you see? There is no effort. There is no prayer. There is no condition like you fast for 40 days and then maybe God will touch you. No, the miracle is instant, the miracle is complete, the miracle is visible, the miracle is verifiable, the miracle is undeniable even by the opponents of the Christian faith. And guess what? The miracle is unconditional. Why will today's pastor will ask you to sow a seed before you can be healed? While well, today's pastor will ask you to pray or fast for 40 days or go to the prayer mountain before you can be healed. While well, today's pastor will ask you to confess your sins and maybe first cut yourself off from ancestral curses and roots. We don't see any of that in the scriptures. In fact, we don't even know whether this man was a Christian. Is it possible that he wasn't even a Christian? Sure. Is it possible he didn't even understand the gospel? Oh, yes. Is it possible he didn't even believe in Jesus? Yes. When God performs a miracle, he does not ask for the consent of the recipient. He does not give conditions to the sick person. Do the following and then you will be healed. He does not say, now that I have healed you, be careful and start going to church. Otherwise, your lameness will come again. The unconditionality of the miracle is what we see showcased in this passage clearly. That when God has performed the miracle, it is unconditional, no strings attached, it is undeniable, it is instant, it is complete. 
but you come to today's church and so many conditions. So many do's and don'ts that you need to do before you can receive the miracle. And even when you have gotten it, it is invisible, it is subjective. We don't even know whether it has actually happened apart from the recipient. And sometimes we even hear rumors that some people have been paid or even bought to come and dramatize miracles that have not actually happened to authenticate the man of God's credibility. What a sad thing, what a challenge. It is important that we see the differences. That biblical miracles are authentic apart from the subjective experiences we see today. Now, are we saying we should not believe in miracles? Certainly not. Are we saying miracles can't happen today? Of course, that's not what we are saying. Are we saying God cannot actually do them? We all know God is a sovereign God. He can do them. What we are saying is that be very careful. Not everything that actually looks like a miracle is and that's why the Bible in several places warns people about false prophets and false Christs who will come and perform miracles with the intention of deceiving the elect. We also need to remember, friends, that because a pastor or a man of God prays and the miracle happens, doesn't actually authenticate him as a man of God. Jesus warned his followers in Matthew 24, 24. When he says that in those last days, false Christs and false prophets will come in among you. They will perform signs and wonders, if possible, even to deceive the elect. But what is very interesting, when you go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, what does Jesus say? He says, you shall know them by their fruit. Now you might be wondering, why doesn't he say you shall know them by their miracles? No, miracles is not a test case for a faithful man of God. People are not men of God or anointed or faithful because they perform the supernatural. No, 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 no. no. You shall know them by their fruit. And again, I want you to notice that these miracles are not just miracles for the sake of the, 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 the recipient feeling good. There is always a purpose for which God performs these miracles. Do you notice that when this man has been healed, he doesn't jump and run home shouting and praising and that's the end of the story? No, 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 no. no. This man is not only transformed physically and visibly, he is also transformed inwardly. He joins the disciples or the apostles into a praise, a jubilation to the glory of God. He follows them to the temple. A crowd has gathered. And Peter, taking advantage of this moment, begins to proclaim the gospel. Not just the gospel, but the gospel about a Jesus who heals physically and heals holistically. In other words, what we are saying here, that this miracle served as an occasion for people to listen to the gospel. It pointed them to the Jesus who healed this man and who could heal all those that were listening holistically, not just physically. At the end of Peter's preaching, we have a call to repentance and forgiveness of sins. So in other words, the miracle we see here does not end with the man who was healed, but the greater miracle in the passage is the forgiveness of the so many multitudes of people that gathered that day. It was a miracle on one level physically, but it was a much greater miracle on another level spiritually, that when all is said and done, the physical miracle has led people to the spiritual miracle where there is an encounter of transformation in Christ Jesus. It is very sad when people look at the miracle as an end goal, and they think God is here just to heal us, just to change us, just to, to give us the things we need, and they forget that there is much more in God dealing with his people than just supplying their needs. At the end of the day, attention is not centered on the man who was healed. No, his attention is centered on the disciples, by the way, who prayed for him, Peter and John. At the end of the day, the whole attention is centered on the Jesus whom they handed over, whom they crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and now who powerfully extends forgiveness of sins and a new beginning for everyone who will believe. So what was the miracle in the passage? Of course, the lame man was able to walk, but is that all there is to it? No! At the end of the day, people's lives are changed. Jesus is acknowledged. He is proclaimed powerfully and he is believed in. And every time we look at the miracle as an end in itself, we miss the purpose. Miracles are signposts that are supposed to lead us to Christ. 
That is why the apostle John could say at the end of his book or his gospel that these signs and wonders, there are so many that Jesus did, but these have been written so that you may know that Jesus Christ is the son of God and by believing in him, you may have eternal life. Why does John record the miracles? So that you may know. Why did Jesus perform the miracles? So that you may know. Why are they written in the scriptures? So that you may know. And by knowing who Jesus is and placing your trust in him, you receive eternal life. So what is the greatest miracle? Restoration of legs? No. Restoration of sight? No. Are they good miracles? Yes. Are they enough? No. So what should we look for? <coughs> eternal life. Praise the Lord.